In this, our ninth lecture, we continue our exploration of life lessons that we learn from the great books. And in this section, we are pondering the choices that we make as we go through life and whether, in fact, we gain in wisdom as we live. I think the short answer may well be no, but we will go into this in more detail. In our last lecture, we looked at the youth, the youth of Hamlet, in the tragic vision of Shakespeare's Hamlet. We will now look at the tragic vision of another of the greatest writers of all times, Sophocles of the Athenian democracy. Now, in Shakespeare, there is not a lot of formal philosophy. Shakespeare tells us a little bit about politics. That is to say, Shakespeare believes that democracy is bad and a strong, just king is good. But uh, beyond that, he focuses on human nature. Uh, Shakespeare wrote quickly, and he wrote for an audience, and he wrote to make money. So his plays were very fluid. I'm always amused when people come up and say, but you're not quoting Shakespeare exactly. Well, he never oversaw the published versions of his plays. If you went to the same play, Hamlet, four nights in a row, you'd see four different versions. Shakespeare never dragged an actor off stage and said, you're not following what I wrote. The actor improvised. And if it worked with the audience, that was good enough for Shakespeare. And so too, Sophocles wrote for an audience. And he wrote to please. But he wrote for an audience that was democratic. And Sophocles believed in the true greatness of the Athenian democracy. For the Athenian democracy of the 5th century BC was the first government in history to be founded on the belief in the greatest good for the greatest number of citizens. It was a democracy that rested upon the right of trial by jury, that rested upon the ideal that every citizen could perform any governmental function, that every citizen should hold any office, and to achieve that end, Offices were not done by elections, but by random lottery. You simply, as a citizen, put your hand in a vase, and if you came up with the right color of cube, you were made, on the, made to serve on the committee of uh, taking care of the warships or taking care of the water supply. Juries were made up of 501 citizens to ensure that as many people in a complete cross-section served in this fundamental civic duty. And the Athenians ruled an empire. And every decision of war and peace, every decision of taxation, was made not by a few elected representatives, experts, was made by all of the citizens coming together in the assembly and voting for it. But the Athenians did not believe they should simply be let loose. They believed that they should be educated for this awesome responsibility of self-government. And to educate themselves, they devised the most creative era in all of human history. The whole of the city of Athens was an education. The magnificent buildings that still awaken our admiration today, the Parthenon, the Temple of Athena Nike, these were planned and paid for by the people themselves, the citizens themselves, not again by a group of experts. In Athens, in order to explain to the Athenians the lessons of the past, the first true history was written in the form of Herodotus and Thucydides. Scientific medicine was developed there, and first in the Athenian democracy do we hear the idea that every citizen, regardless of their wealth, deserves the best possible medical care paid for by the government. It was there that rhetoric was first invented, not as a series of sound bites, but as the necessity of persuading free men to undertake the course that was best for them. And it was there that the Athenian tragedy was invented. These dramatic performances put on once a year before the whole of the Athenian citizen body with the aim of providing a continuous forum for the discussion of the most profound moral implications of politics. For the Athenians believe that every political action has moral consequences. And Sophocles 
was the greatest of all these playwrights. He was, like all the playwrights, like Euripides and Aeschylus, an Athenian citizen. He lived a long life and served his country in many, many positions. But every year he produced a tragedy. You put on four plays, and they were linked, to, uh, linked together in a common theme. They were put on in the form of what we would consider almost an opera. The lines were all poetic. The lines were all sung. There was elaborate music that went along with them, elaborate stage effects, elaborate costumes. In fact, Aristotle defined a tragedy as the imitation of an action that is complete and noble, carried out with beautiful music and sound effects, and arousing in the audience the emotions of fear and pity, and thereby achieving a catharsis, a purging of those emotions of fear and pity. The imitation of an action, performed and not narrated, Aristotle tells us in the Poetics. You don't see the action itself, you see it reenacted. And it is not read to you, it is performed. It has the music, and its goal is to arouse in you the feelings of fear and pity for the central figure. That central figure must be noble. Tragedy does not happen to ordinary people. If a wino gets drunk on the streets of Washington and freezes to death, that's sad. But tragedy is the fall of a great and wise man or woman with the idea that if such a person of wisdom and greatness can fall and make a mistake, for tragedy is all about the mistake that you make, then how much more likely are you to make that tragic mistake? And the action must be complete. That is to say, most tragedies occur in one day. You start off happy in the morning and end up devastated by the end of the day. And finally, by feeling fear and pity for that actor, you thereby purge it from yourself and go out of that theater with wisdom. Wisdom that is learned only by suffering, the Greeks believed. But you don't have to suffer. Character has suffered for you. And the Athenians believed that no two emotions, more than fear and pity, clouded your judgments in making fundamental political decisions. Never make a decision when you're afraid, and never do something because you feel sorry for someone else. And in his mid-career, Sophocles explored the tragic lessons in the fate of Ajax. Almost all of these tragedies were set in the distant past, not in the immediate present of the 5th century B.C., because the Athenians wanted to show that these were enduring issues that echo through the centuries, just as we believe that each of these issues occurs again and again in every generation. And the central issue is pride. Pride, one of the most characteristic of human feelings, the pride that goes before a fall. And the Greeks had a special word for it, hubris, outrageous arrogance, an abuse of power that comes about when you are feeling so powerful that a kind of moral blindness comes over you, making you believe that you can do anything and get away with it. Hubris. And the greater you were, the more likely you were to commit hubris. And the Athenian people constantly kept in mind that maybe even their empire itself, maybe the, even the idea of a democracy was hubris, believing men could do things that they were not meant by the gods to do. And Ajax. Ajax was one of the mightiest warriors of the Greek army that besieged the city of Troy so long before that, almost a thousand years before that. Now, the Trojan War was a constant source of inspiration for Athenian tragedies. Because the Trojan War, as told in that magnificent poem, the Iliad, which was part of every Athenian's education, the Trojan War was one of the great statements of folly and hubris. The very cause of the war lay in hubris. When Paris went to Sparta, 
abused, outraged the hospitality of King Menelaus and took away Helen. In fact, hubris is an Athenian legal term for rape. But Helen, in fact, wasn't taken by force. She had gone willingly. But now the hubris, the pride of Menelaus was outraged that his wife would leave him. And instead of just saying, well, you know, she's run off. What can I do? I'll find another woman. No. He then invoked the promise that all the heroes had made when they were courting the most beautiful woman, Helen, that if she were ever taken away from Menelaus, they would all join together to help avenge him. And so he called upon the kings of Greece, his brother Agamemnon, rich in gold from Mycenae, Achilles, Odysseus, Ajax from the island of Salamis. You must now go and help me get back my wife. So they began the siege of Troy. Now, once again, it was hubris on the part of Troy. They could have simply said, oh, let's negotiate. You want to back? Take her. This is not worth the war. But no, their honor was at stake now. And for Sophocles, one of the most dangerous of all illusions is honor. The idea that there are things that can never be expunged except by blood. Hence, you have a duel. Sophocles cautions, maybe there are things that you just negotiate about. And honor is a word that not all of us can afford, but the Trojans had to have their honor. This was, a, in a way, a preemptive war. Uh, the Greeks struck the Trojans because they also said, well, if the Trojans will come over here and take away one of our wives, what will they do next? So we got to strike them before they get too powerful. It'll be a short war. We have mustered the largest army in all of Greek history, the largest fleet. Well, in fact, as in other wars that we might think of, it went on longer and longer and longer. And for nine long years, men died around the walls of Troy, and still it went on. The mightiest of the warriors, Achilles, died. When he had been born, his mother gave him a choice. Did he want his mother, who was divine? His mother gave him the choice, do you want to live to a ripe old age? Or do you want to die young and glorious? And he said, I want to die young and glorious and leave behind a name so that 3,000 years later, people will still be lecturing about me in worlds I don't even know exist. So she took him and dipped him into the river Styx to make him immortal. But she had to hold him one place by his little heel. And there he was vulnerable. And it was there by all ironies that Paris the most cowardly of all the Trojans, the one who'd started all of this trouble by escaping with Helen, shot him with an arrow. And Achilles was dead. When the great hero was dead, the question arose, which of these Greek warriors that have fought so bravely around the walls of Troy, who among them will be given the armor of Achilles as a sign of the highest recognition? Well, the only obvious candidate was Ajax, the son of Telamon. When Achilles had been sulking in his tent, Ajax had led the armies. Ajax had so proven his glory on the field of battle and his bravery that the mighty Hector had recognized him with friendship as the bravest of all the Greek foes. And he and Hector the Trojan had exchanged gifts. He had given Hector a magnificent golden girdle, and Hector had given to Ajax his own sword. Ajax stepped forward and said, well, I'm the one who deserves them. Uh, Menelaus and Agamemnon, these two brothers, Agamemnon being the commander-in-chief of the expeditionary force because he brought the largest army and was king over the rich richest city, they didn't like Ajax. And they thought he was a threat to their own power. So they said, no, no, the only fair way to do this is to have an election. Now, when you know you deserve a job and there's suddenly going to be an election or a search or whatever, you know they've decided not to give you that job. Take that away that. Now, we're going to have an election, and all the kings who have come to serve, all the war chieftains will vote. And then, of course, Agamemnon and Menelaus rigged the election. And they gave it to their favorite, Odysseus. Now, he was a good warrior, but he was clever, and they needed him. He was the best manipulator in the whole army, and he could always get the men to do what was needed to be done. So he was valuable. And the election was held, and Odysseus, the man of many wiles, the man who knew how to tell many lies and to tell them well, 
receive the armor of Achilles. And our play opens after that event. Ajax had been utterly undone by this decision. He had been dishonored. And he could only get back his honor by blood. And he determined to shed the blood of the whole Greek army to kill not only the war chieftains, but every one of them to show them that he was the mightiest of all warriors. Now, once you've made up your mind to do something like that, the gods intervene. And we tend to make fun of the Homeric gods, Zeus with his many affairs, Hera the jealous wife. But to the Greeks, they were very real divine power. And if they had personal qualities, it was, enable, was to enable the Greeks to understand them more and to approach them in all their majesty and power. And the gods were to be approached with awe and fear and trembling. For the gods were jealous themselves. They looked down upon a man like Ajax as a man filled with pride. Oh, he had made all the gods mad at him when he got ready to sail to the great war against Troy. His father was a famous warrior, and his father had come to Troy in an earlier day and helped Hercules carry away a beautiful maiden who had then been married to the father Telamon. And as the son Ajax got ready to sail, he said to his father, I will come back with greater glory than you ever won, father. And the father said, don't talk in such high tones. Now immediately say a prayer to the gods that you did not mean it, that you are not prideful, because a pride does go before a fall. I don't need the gods, Father. Ah, my right arm, my sword, and my mighty shield, they are all I need. And then in the course of the war, he was in battle, and Athena came down beside him to help him. And he said, go help some other Greek. I don't need you, goddess Athena. I can win on my own. I don't want you sharing my glory. Ah, you see? And so Athena was determined to destroy him. But the way the gods operate is they set you up in a situation. They lead you into the net, as Athena tells the audience. But you can still get out. And all Ajax had to do was to say, as we said, yeah, when we talked about Hamlet. Well, I've been outraged and wrong, but I'm going to move on. I'll show them by my deeds in battle against the enemy that they made the wrong decision. But no, he was determined to kill the Greeks. And so Athena settled the moral blindness, eighty, as the Greeks called it. And he stalked out at night thinking he was falling upon the Greek army, and instead he fell upon a herd of cattle and sheep. And all through the night he raged up and down among the flocks of animals, killing and killing and killing, but thinking he was killing the great warriors like Menelaus, thinking that he was going to capture and kill Odysseus, thinking he was killing one Greek after another. And when the dawn broke, he was all splattered with blood. And the Greeks woke up and said, what was all that uh, mellowing of the cows last night? What's it called? A moo. They moved this mooing of the cows and the buying of the sheep. <gasps> Look at all our flock. Where are we going to get done it tonight? They're all dead. Who killed all these sheep? There's Ajax. Look at him. He's dragging that one big white sheep along with him. And he keeps calling him Odysseus and calling him the vilest of curses. And he's just dragged that sheep into his tent. Ajax. Ajax killed all those animals. <laughs> what was he thinking about? Is that what he can do now is kill innocent sheep and cows? And then he tied up the sheep that he thought was Odysseus in his blindness to the tent pole in the center of his tent and began to beat it, calling it name after name and said, I'm going to beat you to death. And Odysseus stands before the tent looking in as his sheep is beaten. And Athena comes down beside Odysseus, and she says, Well, have I taken good care of you, my best friend, my favorite Odysseus? Have I not now utterly ruined your hated competitor, Ajax? Now the whole army will laugh at him. 
How did you manage to do that? Ah, oh, just the way I told you. I set up the situation. I made him go mad with his love of honor. And now he has destroyed himself in the eyes of all. And just as suddenly as she had brought it on, she took away the madness. And Ajax there stood before this bloody and beaten sheep. And here's the laughter of the whole army about Ajax. And now he has been doubly dishonored. Dishonored by not getting the armor of Achilles and dishonored by this foolish action. His wife comes to him as he is sitting there shrieking. Oh, oh why? She said, you never shriek like that. You think it's a weakness. Why did I do this? Dear, you lost your mind. But there's nothing that can't be recovered. No, I can never get over this shame. Yes, you can. No, I know what you are thinking, my husband, and do not do it. You must not take your life. That is all that is left for me. No, it is not. There is no reason to kill yourself for one extremely foolish action. They'll laugh, they'll laugh day after day, but sooner or later they'll get over it. No. Then think of me. I am your wife. You took me captive here in Troy. I have no home back in Greece. You are my fatherland. If you kill yourself, I will become an object of shame and pity. Some other war chief will take me as his slave and concubine. I will till the fields far off. Think of me. Do you owe me nothing? My honor. My honor is gone. How can you talk of yourself when my honor has been destroyed? I'm your wife. Aren't I more important than honor? No. I can't go back and face my father. He expected me to come back the most famous of all the warriors. Now I'll come back as the biggest fool. Think of my reputation destroyed. Your reputation is in your own hands, my darling husband. No, no, it's what others think about me. All right, then consider your child, our son. You love him, don't you? Oh, I love him more than anything, and that's why I can't let him have a fool for a father. I've got to kill myself to remove that stain. What you will do, he's the son of a foreigner and you. He will be raised as a slave. They will take him away from me. He will till someone else's fields. He will be beaten and despised. You must, for his sake, his sake, stay. No, no. Bring my boy to me, though. I want to see him. Here he is. Look upon him. Hold him in your arms and tell him you will stay with him forever. I must part, my boy, but I want you to be a warrior and a man, and you avenge my honor. What are you going to do? It's not for you to know. You'll find out soon enough. And Ajax goes down to the seashore and there bathes himself to rid himself of all of this blood to purify himself. And he calls upon the gods to sanction his suicide. And he looks at the sword in his hand and he says, this was the sword that Hector gave me. At least I know this. He thought I was the bravest of all the warriors, and I gave him that girdle. That was the very girdle that Achilles used to tie Hector after he'd killed him to the back of his chariot and drag him around. My girdle brought suffering to Hector as his sword has brought suffering to me. No gift is all good. He wedges his sword into a, between two rocks, and falls upon it and is dead. His brother coming back from the conflict is told from afar by the laughter of the Greeks as they see him, Toyker, coming. Aha, here comes the brother of the fool Ajax. Ha <laughs> ha, you thought you were a mighty warrior. You're nothing. You're just like your brother. In fact, you're worse. Even he was a fo You're a foreigner. Yeah, your mother's a foreigner. You'll have no place in our army now. We'll make you a slave. That's the way we're going to make his wife and his child a slave. Do you think people really take pity on you when you fall? Yeah, we'll ruin all of you now. And Menelaus and Agamemnon come to the body of Ajax. He's surrounded there by his wife, his child, and his brother. And Ajax, Ajax's body is 
torn by the great sword wound. The water is washing over him. The blood is going out into the wine dark sea. And Torquil says, we must now bury my brother. Give him a funeral pyre as befits a warrior. Per perform the final rites that we owe him and the gods. And Menelaus and Agamemnon say, you're not going to bury him. The dogs are going to feast upon his flesh. We hated him in life, and we will continue our vengeance in death. You have no place anymore. You're a foreigner. Your brother is dead. You're a slave now, so keep your mouth shut. We will outrage his body. And that's the worst thing that could happen to a Greek, was the idea that your body was not cremated or at least buried, and that your soul would wander forever. In the midst of all of this, Odysseus comes up. And he says, what is all this shrieking going on about? And Menelaus and Agamemnon say, you'll be happy to learn that your bitter enemy there, Ajax, the one who hated you, the one who was trying to kill you last night, his body is going to rot and the vultures are going to feast upon it. And nobody can stop us. Aren't you proud of us? And Odysseus, who has truly hated Ajax, but he is the one that the gods have blessed with true wisdom, says, May I tell you something, Agamemnon, that is true without making you mad? Well, if anybody in the army can, you can. What is it? This is wrong. You have the power to do it, but it is wrong. You are violating the laws of the gods. This will bring disaster upon us. Remember always to know thyself, to know that you are human and that there will be consequences for wrong do deeds. The gods watch everything. We do not understand their ways, but this we know, that ultimately the gods punish evil and they reward good. I tell you this, young boy, son of Ajax, I will raise you like my own. I will take you back to Greece and you will have every honor. And you, wife of Ajax, you will be treated with all honor as well. This I can do for you. You will never be slaves. And now, let us raise up a funeral pyre and perform all the rites for this mightiest of warrior whose blindness caused his fall. Very powerful lesson in that play. One that still echoes right down to us today. In the world of Homer, it was a world of reputation. That is what Achilles told his mother. I want to win the greatest reputation for glory. At the height of the war at Troy, Hector's wife came to him with their little boy and she said, stay. Do not go back into the battle. It is a pointless war. If the rest of the Trojans won't make peace, then let us go away and find a new life. You must not die. It is not worth it. And he took up the little boy and said, I want my son to grow up and to know that he was the, might, the son of the mightiest of all warriors, Hector. I know I will die in battle if I go back in, but I will leave behind that reputation. Well, in a far less noble way, how much today are we not creatures of reputation? People tell me that you are what they Google you on. And the whole of the Internet is filled with stories and blogs. And the most powerful of politicians live in constant fear that they will make one mistake that will then be hammered home again and again until their reputation is gone. Well, wiser Greeks said, no one can really control your reputation. The reputation must be in your own heart. And a reputation is based only on what other people think about you is false. It is a delusion. But even the greatest of the Trojan warriors and the Greek warriors could not get over that idea about reputation. Menelaus felt that his reputation had been ruined, so he launched this great expedition against Troy. The Trojans worried about their reputation, and they lost thousands of their sons in a pointless battle and ultimately their whole city. And Ajax tore himself away from his beloved wife and child, all in the name of reputation.